I should begin by saying that I am extremely sorry about the delay. I was supposed to film this on the 18th of January, but then a bunch of things came up and my throat got cursed by the winter. And after I'm in somewhat like a position to make this presentation, when well, I already made it back then, I present with great love and fervor how my background made me a hyperpolyglot. And in this presentation, we're actually going to show you the one thing you need to actually be a language enthusiast who fluent in languages, admired by your peers. You only need one thing and anyone on the planet can get it. And so we're gonna show you exactly what it is. But first, let's go ahead and tell about what it is not. So what exactly? makes a hyperpolyglot. And it's very interesting that we have this shown in Grand Canyon, the great American symbol with a bunch of yarmulkes from Tzfat in the background. So is it travel opportunities? Uh, the fact is, is yes, those can significantly help. But the fact is, is that in the age of the internet, and I cannot stress this well enough, even if you are stuck in a remote village and internet connection is really all you really need in order to genuinely get a connection and a fluency in multiple languages. You, they're virtual friends, many ways to use languages online and active and passive forms. So the fact is, is that you do not need plane tickets. Uh, is it growing up with multiple languages? Yes, those can indeed provide an advantage, but I've actually seen cases in which people have literally grown up with a language and ever since age six, they've forgotten it completely. And I, and even a significant amount of my friends, have actually bested them in their native language. So in many cases, no, it's not that. Is it an innate talent? The fact is, is that I do not see myself as someone with a talent. I would think that literally all of my hyperpolyglot friends don't see themselves as talented, usually. Maybe there are a handful of exceptions. But above all, it's a bit like throwing peas at a wall. The fact is that if you throw enough peas at the wall, then some of them will really stick. And so the issue is not really giving up and really chasing your dreams and what you want in your life with deep passion. That's going to, um, part of me really thinks that talent can be a little bit used as a crutch in order to somehow give up more easily. And uh, the fact is, is that I think that you deserve your fulfilled dreams. And now I'm going to reveal the one thing that you need. So if you want to raise a hyperpolyglot child, you ultimately need to make him or her curious about the world. In my interview with Ari in Beijing, which is nearly two years old at this point, um, I said that probably one pivotal moment in which I really decided I wanted to speak multiple languages was actually when I was a toddler and I was given a board book, a big board book of maps of the world. And I think that to some degree that was the most pivotal moment of my polyglot career because that really determined the it planted the seed of a passion that would really show in me becoming a translator, teacher, presenting at polyglot conferences, and much more. Not also to mention the various misadventures I've had at Mundolingo and beyond. And um, as to my childhood, now we get to the Jared story. So my mom was a recent co convert to Judaism and she met my father in Manhattan. So my dad comes from an Ashkenazi Jewish background, Hungarian and Litvak via what is now Ukraine. And my mom is half Swedish and the other half very deep American roots that I think actually predate the, um, the Declaration of Independence. And uh, so as a result, I felt confused on multiple fronts. Uh, to some degree, I really feel myself a surface member of many communities, but a genuine member of none. And so the identity void is one thing that can actually cause someone to be very, very curious. And as a result of really having been somewhat in the middle room in a lot of these contexts, I never really had any sense of belonging anywhere especially since my parents sought to fit to distance me from many forms of American popular culture uh, at the time I hit adolescence. And so I have a deep knowledge of American culture, culture for kids, but then after that, I'm completely blanking out. And I somewhat like to joke to my friends that I 
know more about Greenlandic contemporary popular music and culture than I do that of the country I was born in. And I think that's um, a fair assessment. And to be honest, I think I should be proud of it. Uh, especially given that I didn't set foot in Greenland until about a year and a half ago. Okay, so fast forward to age 10. I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish day school of hard knocks, significant disdain for the outside world and many other types of Jews in general. Usually uh, reformed Jews were knocked with insults, sometimes on a daily basis. I get instilled with a deep knowledge of the texts, but also a significant fear of divine punishment. And uh, it's also interesting because my parents at home still really wanted me to, for example, acknowledge the fact that Palestinians are human beings, that every single human being deserves the right to life liberty, pursuit of happiness. Oh, do you have I heard that before? And um, so, born that really despite this, in part because of my parental upbringing, I was really, in many respects, on a surface level, I feel uh, significantly immune to a lot of the prejudices that I really think dominated there, as a result of there really being one flavor that most people there identified with strongly. And I needed more than that life, and I still do. So from Orthodox Jewish day school to inner city public high school, that was very deeply traumatic in a sense. The fact is that I really couldn't relate to what I saw around me at all. But my parents thought it would make me a well-rounded person that would uh, get along well with um, people from any nationality. And little did they know what they would end up becoming in my 20s. And so that, I really have to say that when I was like 14 years old, and then like in this yeshiva world, and then I you know, end up in this entirely new sphere with people who don't really have a lot of cultural similarities with me, aside from like genuinely being human, to some degree, I felt that I was, I really needed to learn an entire new way of existence. And I actually didn't feel culture shock that strong until I literally set foot in the developing world for the first time. To some degree, I got that in Jordan, but then later on in Myanmar and Fiji, that was even stronger, especially given that Myanmar has only really recently opened up to the world outside of it. And then after high school, we go to Wesleyan University, where I was exposed to another side of contemporary American life as well. And um, I was very religiously observant for most of my life until from before my bar mitzvah until age 24 when I started to throw it up and I stopped keeping a lot of the prohibitions. This was actually a very deeply painful process for me. I remember actually I was in Germany at the time when I actually decided to not be Shema Shabbat anymore and I remember like walking in forests and like wondering perhaps maybe if God would punish me or somehow strike me down with an illness or something like that. And um, thankfully, my parents really chose to accept me despite everything, and I'm very grateful because of that. Um, as a result now, I feel that um, while I am independent, I feel that my parents and I are more on the same wavelength concerning religious practice in general. And uh, to some degree, I even felt that in my childhood that I somehow always predicted that that would happen. And so now after college, and so uh, Jerusalem, Krakow, Stockholm, Heidelberg, Manhattan, Connecticut, and Brooklyn, with brief interludes in Finland, Greece, Myanmar, Greenland, and Fiji. So the fact is, is um, be give, be given that I was like a ball that was thrown around the world very often, I, in many respects, I felt like I really needed to relearn things on a yearly basis. And also what made things even odder is the fact that I think that some expatriates really expected some places like Israel and Germany to be, quote, just like the United States, unquote. And they most, most certainly were not, despite various similarities in what was in the store and knowledge about politics, etc. Uh, the fact is that one very noteworthy example, I think in Israel, um, I might get into this later, uh, people treat you like you're not a stranger. And I think that that's actually very, very refreshing. In the United States, and certainly in Scandinavia, this is most assuredly not the case. Well, for most of the United States, in any case, or most of what I've seen. So I need to, I cannot emphasize this enough. So the travel experience does not equal language skills. So I have traveled to 24 sovereign countries as of the time of me speaking this. The fact is, is that I know people who have been to a lot more. And the fact is, is that they are not 10 plus language hyperpolyglots, and I know 
um, many of those 10 plus language hyperpolyglots that are actually below average concerning number of countries they visited. So too many people travel the world and don't see much of their language skills improve. So what exactly did I do? Chances are you probably noticed a pattern from my life story in the previous page. I got thrown from one world into another very, very quickly. And so as a result, I barely had any sense of belonging anywhere. And in order to fulfill what I needed to grasp on markers of what made cultures unique, especially given that in many cases, instant language, culture, and knowledge, knowledge of those can lead to instant friendships. And I've seen this play out on a daily basis in New York City. Then there's always the understanding that perhaps for the rest of my life I will not know what inner peace is, because the fact remains is that my identity was always on shaky ground and this led me to be an explorer. And more than just visiting a place just to see nice things, I was an identity shopper as well, and so with each place that I visited, I found my identity significantly changed. And so, during the places that I stayed for longer than three months, um, so in the USA, I think that I've really learned to become more artistic and theatrical in many respects. I think that uh, despite certain aspects of conformity, I also think there are pockets of the United States that really chase their dreams with significant passion. And I think a lot of my English students, for example, they really see that and they admire that, whether they're from the Middle East, East Asia, anywhere in Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, this is one thing that they really associate with the United States. And I think that Americans' reputation in this respect is very well reserved. And um, then Israel, I really noticed that um, I loved the fact that even like on my first day that security guards and uh, students would have deep conversations with me, um, even if they didn't know me very well on the surface level, small talk was often non-existent. I think a lot of people were really willing to discuss very sensitive topics up front, and I really, really enjoyed that refreshing aspect to a degree that I almost became genuinely sad and underwent withdrawal when I went back to the United States. And I know that so many of you who have been to Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or what have you can probably relate. Poland is extremely interesting because one thing that I've really noticed, uh, Jonathan Ornstein, who may actually be watching this presentation right now, uh, he was the, uh, still is the leader of the Jewish Community Center of Krakow, which you can still visit and uh, do various Jewish things there. And I remember he told me once that I admire the Polish working spirit, that if I were to make a company 50 people, that I would hire 49 Polish people and I would make the boss an American because the fact is, is that um, and one thing I really noticed as well is that I think a lot of people were truly hell-bent on self-improvement and I see this in Polish-American communities as well. I think a lot of, I saw among my Polish peers that they were genuinely interested in putting forth the best versions of themselves in many respects. Uh, obviously, I know that Poland is very much a divided country, and very much like the United States, there are many different versions of it. In part, this is because I, it was uh, split up between three different sovereign states for a lot of its existence. So it was the big Poland-Lithuania, and then split up between Prussia, Russia, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, that really results in it being divided, not unlike, for example, the United States in a similar respect. Uh, so one thing I genuinely noticed is uh, I think I really got encouraged to take my work very, very seriously all of the time and to really actively put research to find out about my surroundings, to um, give it my all all of the time. And uh, it was really tough because I somehow feel one thing, and I noticed this in Israel as well, uh, if you do a bad job, at work, a Polish person is going to tell you to your face instantly. And I think a lot of my Polish friends said, we really love straight talking. So if you are an American, get used to that. And in many respects, I somehow went back to the United States and I was a bit of a straight talker and I literally almost lost friendships that way. Um, Sweden is, um, I remember this book, When Cultures Collide, actually discussed, said that Sweden is the most feminine society in the uh, developed developed world. The understanding is that in many masculine societies, there's usually this go-getter culture about, you know, winning stuff and 
achieving stuff. And in Sweden, I think a lot of that was really toned down. In many respects, I think that one thing I really wanted to do, rather than, for example, um, endlessly research, I would sometimes spend time walking in parks. I would uh, go to comic book libraries. And in many respects, one thing I really noticed is that one of my friends told me that anyone who shouts in public in Sweden is either a, fo either a foreigner or drunk. And um, make of that whatever you will, but I really, I only saw over the course of a year, two people get angry in public. And that was, maybe I was looking in all the wrong areas and I was in the rich area of town, but that is very much worth it. And Germany, uh, above all else, a lot of the people there, especially the young people, are extremely deep conversationalists. I think that sometimes a lot of them cared a lot about details to a degree in which they would sometimes go on for sentences at a time. And I think that many Ameri the American side of me just simply wanted to roll my eyes and God, shut up, please! But in many respects, I think that just engaging with the topic very, very deeply in all of its glory, that was really something that I learned to do and to manage to look at everything with very deep eyes and to somehow look at everything with a certain philosophical understanding. And um, I think that that really remains with me despite everything. And um, so perhaps, you know, I understand knowing a culture is actually a lot more difficult than knowing a language. And in many respects, the people who have spent their entire lives in these countries know a lot more about them than I would and are most welcome to disagree. Um, yeah, Germany also is significantly divided as well. Berlin and Hamburg would be significantly more Americanized than Heidelberg, despite the fact that, you know, Heidelberg does have a lot of American influence in many respects. Um, the fact is, is that um, um, I, I, I've heard that Heidelberg is considerably more conservative, for example, and um, that significantly showed. And so, for example, what you may be getting in Berlin versus what you may be getting in Munich may be completely different. Okay, and so the sad reality. Sometimes I feel that I'm a fake member of any society that I can speak the language of, but a true member of nowhere. And the fact remains, uh, Am I a third culture child? And yes, and here's why. It's because um, I, I would say that a third culture child is above all really defined by someone who has to juggle multiple person, not necessarily personalities, but multiple cultures at the same time. And so the fact is, is that when I was in the Orthodox Jewish day school, I got really in the habit of, I'm trying to put it into words. I got in the habit of for example, living in this Orthodox Jewish sphere, and then my parents really didn't know as much about it. My parents were very literate in a lot of the texts, knew a lot of the stories and many details, but uh, the fact remains is that uh, it was significantly deep. A lot of yeshivish really used, and in many respects, I somehow felt confused, and I really needed to put different masks on. And I think that when I went abroad, and then I walked away from orthodoxy, then I actually quadrupled this problem, and uh, which to some degree I realized that I somehow needed to behave very differently depending on which sphere I was in. And then we get to the conclusions. Above all, I think that I owe the fact that I'm a hyperpolyglot due to yes, in part because of my travels, but also more importantly because I feel an identity void. I could get along with many Jews, but the fact is, is that not attending a Jewish summer camp made me feel like an outsider more often than not. And then with American culture, I had a bit of an incomplete picture to some degree, I still do. And this is even truer with other countries where I have lived and other linguistic and ethnic communities of which I regularly partake, for example, Giddishist, Swedish speakers, etc. The identity void has given me a great deal of pain, but I think without it, I wouldn't be a bridge, and I think that bridges are really what the world needs. And so the hyperpolyglot is the bridge, and I think that if you take that, that should probably be your overall takeaway from this presentation. And so next week, we're going to learn how to deal with difficult and or impossible pronunciation. I'm just going to really tell you, um, obviously French really came up enough. Sadly, French is not one of my strongest languages. Uh, Danish, on the other hand, is, and so I'm probably going to definitely go into that in more detail. Uh, to a lesser degree, forms of historical pronunciation in uh, Icelandic, Faroese, and Tibetan, none of which I know considerably well. 
will also be covered on as well as Gaelic languages. So I'm going to really teach you how to deal with the historical pronunciation, um, which I think is very different from impossible, per well, from difficult pronunciation, which usually does involve, for example, how to, for example, knowing what vowel to pronounce when. Like, for example, in my Marshallese book, which is right on this table over here, the vowels are all given like a paragraph almost concerning really how you pronounce them. And um, so um, Impossible Pronunciation is next week, and I really hope that you will enjoy that and realize that your dreams can come true no matter what. Have a good run, and see you next time.